Hello and welcome back to the Walking Dead Retrospective, where today we are entering what I view as the renaissance of the TV series and the new beginning arc. With season 9 more so than any other, all the differences stemming from the past couple of seasons will create two drastically different experiences. So hold on to your sheriff's hats because we are in for a wild, wild ride. All that said, let us dive right in. As per usual, a new season means a look at the state of the franchise as a whole and expectations going into the ninth season. And oh boy, while I refer to season 9 as the renaissance now, if you were following the series at the time, you likely know that the sentiment going into the season was well and truly all over the place. First off, there was the big shakeup in the crew behind the series, with Scott Gimple being replaced by Angela Kang as showrunner. I think I've made my thoughts on the whole deal pretty clear by now, and I do think that the whole Gimple bad narrative was severely blown out of proportion, but whatever the case, it's hard to deny that this news did bring a ton of positive sentiments. Even if Gimple was actually technically promoted and not really replaced, but I digress. Point is, creatively, the show was going to have a huge shakeup, and both me personally as well as the wider community seemed to embrace the change. But of course, let's not avoid the elephant in the room. The news of Andrew Lincoln's exit, which had leaked beforehand, but was also later formally confirmed as we heard that Andrew had only renewed his contract for five episodes. Now, I'll be honest with you, and I don't want to turn this into a huge downer, but when the news broke, there was a number of things in my personal life that really weren't going well at all. And I distinctly remember reading the news during my morning commutes and just thinking, is this really how it ends? In hindsight, even with all the praise Kang gets, I think people tend to forget that she picked up the series when it was in absolute shambles post All Out War. And then having literally Rick Grimes leave the show? It must have been like maneuvering through a storm blindfolded and only going by taste. But yes, as much as the creative shakeup was very much welcome, I won't lie, personally, I felt, for lack of a better expression, hollow going into the season. And keep this bias of mine in mind, as I think it will help contextualize a lot of my thoughts. Spoilers, most of it is very very good, which is why I bring up this hollow feeling going into it. Though in the same vein, let us talk about the ramifications of announcing Rick's exit in the first place. And here, my take might be a bit surprising. More than a few times already, I have clowned on AMC for spoiling their own story by announcing future spin-offs and whatnot, right? Well, to be honest with you, in Rick's case, I am hard-pressed to blame them. As the news had already gotten out long in advance and with something as huge as Rick leaving, I think the pros of playing up that angle yourself do outweigh the cons. Unlike the spin-offs, which were all still years away and blatantly spoiled the survivors of the final season, and perhaps worst yet, some of them even never ended up happening, so it was literally just a spoiler. With Rick, though, that entire time scale was much smaller. And because the cat was out of the bag already, I think you might as well leverage that to your advantage. So yeah, as much as I hated going into the season with what is literally the biggest spoiler anyone could have ever imagined, I think they made the best out of a bad situation, and that's basically it. But don't get me wrong, I also believe that with enough effort, they could have kept his exit under wraps. So while I understand their course of action, I also think that this entire situation could have and should have been avoided, and again, literally the biggest spoiler of the entire series, like seriously ever, should not have been leaked. Anyway, as for promotional material, Season 9, I think rightfully so, had a lot of great art featuring Wreck. And I won't lie, some of these are easily up there with some of my favorites from the earlier seasons. With these things, it's kind of hard to put into words what exactly made me like it, but the All Out War posters, for example, just seem too bombastic for my liking. Whereas these ones are just character-centric. And both the high contrast posters, as well as that signature grimy, nope, that is not a pun, yellowish grainy ones are also great. And the final thing regarding promo is of course Comic-Con and the trailer. Generally speaking, I think the narrative within the trailer and how it's posed as Rick simply talking to Negan is really cool, but I have one very, very extremely specific problem with this trailer that really drops it in my trailer rankings. And that is the song. I know this is going to sound like really, really weird, but I think it's way too modern. 
the song itself, Take What's Mine by Future Royalty, is actually really cool, but I'd expect the GTA 6 trailer to have this kind of music, not The Walking Dead. Might just be me being a weirdo, but it doesn't quite fit for me. And spoilers, I think trailer music-wise, even up to season 11, my favorites are still easily seasons 3 through 6, with 3 and 4 probably taking the cake. But yeah, teaser-wise, this one has a lot of great stuff, like hinting toward a potential clash between Maggie and Rick, something that wasn't really present in the book, a clash between Daryl and Rick, which obviously wasn't in the book, and then we get a surprising scene of Michonne with Lucille, something that immediately sparks questions about whether or not the beast that is Negan has already been unleashed. And how can I not mention the post-credits scene, which I think for every single comic book fan, sent chills down their spines. Not only because of the obvious hint toward the whispers, but also because this is Eugene and Rosita, two massive characters which didn't bode well considering how the comic story went. And one last thing, I remember when the trailer dropped, there were a lot of questions about what this sign to Toledo meant, and whether there was some sort of community that we didn't know about, or something like that. Story-wise, I remember comic book fans discussing how this could be foreshadowing the Commonwealth since it is also in Ohio. And more recently, in World Beyond, we've heard other mentions of Ohio and the conference that happened there. But in this particular case, I think there is a far simpler explanation. Because I'm a Zoomer, I did not know about this either, but apparently this whole Toledo thing is a relatively common reference to the series M.A.S.H. I'm not even going to try to pretend like I know what I'm talking about here, and I have no clue why or how it came to be, and the more you look into it, the more you'll find out about it, but TLDR, I think it's just a fun reference. So to summarize, narrative and tease-wise, definitely a great trailer, but not among my favorites, all things considered, mostly because of the music. And finally, let us talk about the other elephant in the room, the pacing of the season. Clearly, coming off of the back of seasons 7 and 8, we had to pick up steam. And that is exactly what we got. With season 9 adapting roughly 1.1 issues per episode, which is actually sort of deceptive. Because some of the events that were moved into season 9 in the prologue of The Whisperers are actually taken from later in the Whisper arc proper. So in actuality, the adapted issue count is even higher. Point here is that Angela Kang very much went in guns blazing with season 9, and perhaps not surprisingly, I think the reception of the season was also much much better because of the huge ramp up in sheer story adapted. And for those of you not familiar with the book, that'll become clear as we get further on. Alright, I lied. There is one more thing we need to talk about before we get into the story itself, and that is the 100% new opening credits. Of course, throughout the years we'd gotten plenty of updates to the credits as characters rotated in and out of the show, but thematically, it was always the same. That is, until now. And here, I fully realize this is some old man screams at cloud energy, but I like the original a lot more. Of course, I'm not going to pretend, I clearly acknowledge the fact that most of it is probably nostalgia, but even though this one did grow on me as time went on, in my mind, nothing will beat the classic washed out vibe of the previous credits. I know some people fell in love with this one right away, and while I can definitely see why, I do still prefer the older ones. Alright, all that said, let us finally get into the season itself. Right away, it's important to know that, as much as the season is very faithful to the source material with specific notable events, the wider story is drastically different to the point that comparing them is kind of apples to oranges. So just keep in mind that some of these parallels we're talking about do happen under much, much different circumstances. Like for real, by the end of season 9, the TV universe is like 7 to 9 years ahead of the comic in terms of sheer time passed in the apocalypse. No, I am not joking. And similarly, like I mentioned a second ago, some of the events that happen in early season 9 should technically happen in season 10. So we'll have some of those season 3 and 4 moments where certain parts of the story are lifted from far, far later, while others are just pushed down the road. With that in mind, in the show we open with a 18-month time skip and immediately we see how Alexandria has flourished since the war. We see a gate structure reminiscent of the prison, we see farmland, we see the repaired solar panels, and generally, the community has just grown a lot. And this already marks the first major difference in how the show adapted the new beginning. As moments later, we already see the Grimes family and how they're living out there, at this point, much more peaceful days. And by the way, the Judith scene we get here is the cutest thing I've ever seen. It's 
and we were absolutely robbed of these sorts of interactions with all the other time skips. Yes, Spy Family is one of my favorite series. What can I do? It's just too wholesome. Anyway, unlike the show which planted us right back into the shoes of Rick, the comic opened with your somewhat tropey approach of reintroducing us to the now much different Alexandria through Megna's group. Keep in mind that in the comic, broadly speaking, we hadn't really seen any big time jumps so far, while the show, more often than not, skipped the entirety of the winter time, for example. And so, I think Kirkman wanted to fully embrace that foreign feeling of literally everything being completely new, and put us in the shoes of this new group and just like them, we'd be meeting everyone for the first time again. The show, on the other hand, pushed the introduction of Magna's group just a little bit later on. Well, I say a little, but technically it's like five years, so not really a little, but you get what I mean. Though yeah, in the comic, before we see anyone we know, we meet Magna, whose group is suddenly absolutely hammered by a wave of walkers. Though as they're swarmed, Jesus appears on horseback wielding a sword, yelling for them to get back on their feet. But despite Jesus' appearance, Bernie is absolutely torn apart. And it's then that we hear Jesus say for them to run and that they'll distract them prompting Magna to question, who's we? And it's then that we zoom out to see the sheer size of this horde as Heath, Eugene and Rosita all ride in. I know I don't mention it nearly enough, but Charlie Adler's art here is absolutely brilliant. For those of you who are into animation, comics, manga and even just drawing in general, you'll know that horses are an absolute nightmare to get right, but I think Charlie absolutely nailed it. And the horde here is also just really, really cool looking. The win story is then that we finally start getting tidbits of what's going on here, as they begin talking about moving the walkers even further east. And we then cut to Aaron embracing his inner viking and blowing this horn to continue kiting the walkers away. And as we return to Megna, they too piece it together. Whoever this group is, if they are geared enough, smart enough and experienced enough to pull something of this scale off, they must have something worth protecting. But it's of course not all sunshine and rainbows. As Kelly says that, this mission of theirs drove that tsunami of walkers at them in the first place and killed Bernie in the process. Though Megna still says that, this might finally be a safe place, a thing that's worth giving a shot. And Jesus too then rides up, offering them a spot at Alexandria, but of course also exchanging a few words about not really being able to trust one another just yet. And the last thing we see here is a brief conversation between Jesus and Eugene, who explains that, with how things are going now, the Horde will miss the kingdom by at least 10 miles and that they're totally in the clear, saying that they'll camp out tonight and just double check tomorrow before they head home. So again, with Eugene being outside of the walls and essentially leading this entire plan, them casually just camping out in the open, and with what we've already seen with the horses, our main gang has leveled up big time since we last saw them. And I think this entire little mission is very much an explicit plot device to show us just exactly that. And it's only after all of that that we finally cut to Alexandria. And again, in a very cliche fashion, Kirkman did the thing of not showing us Rick's face as we see his little morning routine. And straight away, obviously, this is no longer your monster Rick. This isn't your TV Rick who's still fighting on the front lines. This is a Rick whose body has been absolutely annihilated by the apocalypse. Something that I think is a huge, huge deal in the wider story of The Walking Dead. Because it's just like Negan said way, way back in issue 100. Rick is missing a hand, yet these people still consider him as their strongest and their leader. But now on top of his missing hand, he is also walking with a cane. Very, very explicitly showcasing the scars that have brought him here. And it's as Andrea wakes up calling for him that we finally see the post timeskip Rick. Like I just mentioned with the whole kiting walkers mission, I think the post timeskip character designs are easily some of Charlie's best arts. Which is saying a lot considering everything before this point has a lot of nostalgia attached to it. But for me, everyone from Jesus and Rick to Andrea and Carl, all of their post timeskip designs are just so so much cooler. And yes, I know some of you TV-only folks are already becoming that Leo meme, but yes, Aaron did very much decide to cosplay the comic version of Rick in the show. And this uncanny resemblance also did spark a whole bunch of fan theories about how his story would turn out later. But spoilers, yes, I think Aaron's look in the show is up there with peak Walking Dead character looks. 
but I digress. Story-wise, that point of Rick no longer being the main fighter is reinforced as he says that he has a busy day ahead of him. Which, unlike Jesus' group outside of the walls, is entirely managerial. He says he needs to get the agricultural reports, visit the munitions factory, and so on. So effectively, it's just telling us that Rick's Terminator days are very much over, and he has very much taken that bigger picture visionary role. As Rick is preparing to leave the house, where we also get a mention of fresh bread in a mill that they've built, Carl pops in asking whether Rick has some time to talk. This whole talk of theirs is framed as something that has already been brought up before and that Rick is well aware of. But for simplicity's sake, I'll just spoil the surprise, Carl wants to move to the hilltop and apprentice as a blacksmith. But obviously, Rick is protective and is having a hard time coming to terms that Carl has indeed grown up. They agree to have the conversation later, and that is where we leave them for now. And finally, in the book 2, we get a proper look at the new and improved Alexandria, as we get a proper establishing shot showcasing just how much the community has grown. And before we carry on, let us return to the show, because we've still got a ton of stuff to cover before they converge to the Whisperer arc. Put briefly, episodes 1 through 5 cover mostly TV-exclusive events, and the multiple time jumps we see here are also TV-exclusive. But what complicates things is that there are also these one-to-one -one adaptations mixed throughout all of that. The biggest and most obvious difference here right away is of course the whole mission into Washington that happens in the premiere, none of which happens in the book. Though, if you've been following the retrospective for a while, you'll know full well that I've been rambling on about how we should have seen more cityscapes and whatnot, so big surprise, I absolutely love this brief excursion into the heart of Washington. Though in terms of comic parallels, the closest thing here, I guess, would be that brief little dip into Washington before Alexandria. And I also absolutely love the subtle music here. I think that upbeat tone, combined with the very vibrant summertime shots, set the whole vibe of this new beginning where the survivors have truly conquered the world incredibly well. And in the show too, I think Rick's post timeskip design was absolutely awesome. But I also have one of my very, very specific nitpicks which may or may not get me cancelled. I absolutely despise Daryl's bike. No, like for real. The whole post timeskip vibe was always this return to the pseudo medieval period of basic weaponry, travel by horse, immense focus on agriculture, and so on. And then there's this clown wasting the precious fuel they have to make themselves riding this extremely loud motorcycle into the city of all things, which isn't even useful for transporting anything. Pre time skip, I love Daryl's bikes. Post time skip, I think they stick out like a sore thumb. And this is one of those times where I think the rule of cool went way too overboard. Both from a realism sense as well as purely thematic. That aside though, the rest of the mission into the museum was absolutely awesome, and yet again, after seeing the extended prologue of HBO's The Last of Us, I am here asking whether we can get a new series about the start of the apocalypse and explore these sorts of locations as the world begins to crumble. Like seriously, we need that, why does everybody just skip past the early apocalypse, like come on. And oh boy, don't even get me started on that cursed spider headwalker. Whoever came up with that has seen one too many sleep paralysis demons, because sheesh. And one more neat detail here is the evolution and then de-evolution of man we see here, which is of course a big theme for the season as a whole. The obvious interpretation here is of course that with the apocalypse, people turn into zombies and evolution as we knew it stopped. But then of course there is the counter to that. With our communities flourishing more than ever, it also implies that evolution is as strong as ever. And the final cherry on top is the supposed evolution of the walkers that we'd see later in the season, which would of course turn out to be the Whispers. The one thing I honestly found a little forced, especially knowing the comic material, was the death of Ken here. It is of course posed as the final straw in parts of the hilltop turning on Maggie due to her support of Rick and the Saviors, with Gregory then getting in cahoots with Earl and Tammy and trying to assassinate Maggie, and while the actual hit on Maggie happens in both versions, to me, the escalation always felt a little more natural in the book. Whereas in the show, he pops up for literally the first time ever in the series, immediately dies, and boom, apparently we have a huge turning point. To me, it feels like they needed to rush the Maggie plot since Lauren too would be leaving the show, and that's why I think it feels a little crowbarred in so early. I feel like the whole new beginning vibe should have just gotten a little more room to breathe instead of us hopping right back into drama. But I don't know, I guess that might just be me. 
On the heels of that, we also pop on over to the Sanctuary, where, number one, we see that Daryl is in charge of the Sanctuary, something that is a remixed version of what we see with Dwight in the book. But number two, Rick has very much earned celebrity status among the people there. We'll get to this later in the book, but this angle of Rick trying to escape the limelight is a little more explicit in the book since he doesn't really go out on runs himself anymore. Whereas in the show, he pops up all over the place and so his appearance isn't really that big of a deal. But yeah, TLDR, his whole appearance change is largely fueled by him just not wanting to be recognized as much. Though perhaps most importantly, the sanctuary as it is portrayed in the show is not really a factor in the book anymore. The angle of the Sanctuary revolting would return in the book way later on, but it's not really the same. And is more so something that I think Angela Kang was just inspired by, and so that's what we saw here. In the book, after the war is over, we know that Dwight took over as leader and that they are now a part of the Joint Communities Trade Network, but that's about it. In the show, on the other hand, this whole remnants of Negan loyalist aspect is obviously turned into the bridge arc. And so, not surprisingly, Captain Vane, oh, I mean Rowan, oh, I mean Justin. I'm sorry, the actor is low-key typecast as just a tough, brassy guy. I get them mixed up. I mean, it is what it is, right? Is also entirely TV show exclusive. Like I mentioned before, another big departure in the show is that the whole Gregory plot is pushed up to the premiere. And so, as Maggie is walking baby Herschel, the drunk Earl goes after her and fails spectacularly, after which we get the famous... You wanna leave this place? You can't even murder someone, right? Which is still easily one of my favorite Maggie lines basically ever. And do keep in mind that Earl in the comic is much, much different to the Earl in the TV version. Another pretty big remix here is the arrival of Rick and what that would mean in the story. Big surprise, because the comics version is drastically different, we'll cover that on its own. But in the show, we see Maggie and Rick clash about their support for the saviors and how Maggie thinks they're overexerting themselves as is. This clash between them would never really be as pronounced in the book and is one I am sort of mixed on. Because on one hand, I think it added some really interesting drama that would realistically crop up in situations like these. But on the other, I also really enjoyed the 100% loyal friendship between them that we saw in the book. So this is one of those changes that I don't really think made the story any better or any worse. It's just different. Though unfortunately, because Lauren Cohen would leave the show and then pop back in, I do think that her story in the TV universe is very disjointed and ultimately I would prefer the comic version quite a bit more. And the final thing in this one is of course Gregory's judgment, which in many ways plays out exactly like the book with him enjoying a nice bungee jump, but the wider story differs substantially. Notably, it takes place right before the fair, the first proper event that they've ever done, signifying the rebirth of civilization and proper order. Rick is not there originally, and he would push back a ton after he learned of what happened. Again, it is very, very different, and we'll talk about that when we get there, but the TLDR is that in the comic, Gregory's death just felt like one of countless things going wrong at the same exact time, all just pushing Rick closer and closer to the edge. While in the show, like I already mentioned with Ken's death, it sort of came out of the blue for me. I don't want to spoil it just yet for those of you who haven't read the books yourself, but trust me, when we get there, it'll be well worth it. Oh, and fun fact, from this point onwards, there's like a bajillion easter eggs about the Commonwealth, so that's pretty fun. Returning to the book for a bit, before we follow up with Rick, we also get a few more one-off conversations to paint a clearer picture of how much everything has changed. First off, we see a conversation between Andrea and Sadiq. Yes, this is the comic version of Sadiq. For those of you who have played the Telltale games, you'll recognize him from the Michonne spin-off. But because the Telltale games are a little dubious when it comes to comic continuity, we won't delve into that too much. The TLDR is that he is a fisherman who has moved from the ocean side to Alexandria. So, compared to the show, he is very, very, very different. Though they talk about building living spaces for visitors, and we get our first mentions of this supposed fair. Again, in the comic, this is the only time skip we get, so everything following this point is directly leading us into the Whisper arc. Whereas in the show, the Whispers wouldn't appear for literal years, so such things are just not mentioned by default. Similarly, we also get a brief conversation between Andrea and Rosita, where they talk about how the whole walker kiting mission lasted for five days which is clearly an absolute feat of planning and preparation. So again, they have leveled up big time. We also see the welcoming of Megna's group. K 
Kelly, Lou, Connie, and Yumiko all share the same names, but for all intents and purposes, they are absolutely nothing alike with their comic counterparts. Especially because of how drastically different the Commonwealth arc would be. So, if some of their actions in either version do seem a little wacky compared to the other, just don't think about it too much. They are much more important in the TV version, and I much prefer them in the TV version, so we'll talk about that a whole bunch later on. But one thing that I found really neat here is how the introduction actually happens. Rick mentions that he's got a bad leg, so standing up wouldn't really give a first good impression. Which is cool and all, but I think the symbolism here is so, so interesting. Think of something like an interrogation, or even something like a job interview, or anything like that. The person standing up is always posed as the one in power, right? Well here, that is completely flipped on its head, as Rick is literally the only one sitting down. And yes, I know I sound like a broken record, but I think is yet another way of Kirkman telling us that Rick's days of always being the one making demands are over. As we'll see later on, he's still absolutely got that killer instinct when he needs to. But he is just much more at peace and doesn't need to come off as powerful or threatening. We'll obviously talk about this plenty more later on, but post time skip Rick was always an absolute blast to follow, because to me, he always seemed to be the one with the biggest transformation over the time skip. So these sorts of interactions really were like meeting Rick for the first time again. Following the immediate Magna meeting, we also see a debrief between Eugene and Rick, where Eugene lets Rick know that using the horn proved successful in kiting the horde, and that their entire system with the riders seems to be running quite well. Finishing by saying that they successfully managed the biggest horde they've ever encountered without putting a single person in danger. And hearing this, Rick bluntly says, That is great to hear, because that was the last time you were outside of the walls. Just like with All Out War and the bullet production there, Eugene is absolutely the brains of Alexandria. So this is just Rick understanding his value and not wanting to risk losing the man who effectively brought them back into civilization. And this little conversation they have here is still among my favorites in the comic. As Eugene claims that it's not like he designed any of this, he just read a book. But Rick then tells him to stop selling himself shorts and that he's doing far far more. It's just a really cool down to earth moment between them, and despite the huge leap in resources that has happened, still makes it feel like, yes, we are still operating in a zombie apocalypse. A version of this also happens in the show, but to me, this is one of, admittedly, very very few Eugene sequences that hit harder in the comic. Anyway, that's enough rambling about that, we'll talk about Eugene plenty more later down the line. The last little thing I want to mention here is the super brief scene we get of Rick heading home. He sees a random Alexandrian run past him, to whom he casually says, Show off. I mean, come on, you can't tell me this doesn't just immediately put a smile on your face. In something as dark as The Walking Dead, Rick just bantering around has to be about as wholesome as Judith talking about his grumpy face. Anyway, that aside, as Rick gets home, Carl's already there waiting for him and asking whether they can finally have that talk. For TV only folks, while Carl can still be pretty 0 to 100, as we'd see shortly, he has matured throughout the time skip and doesn't really press Rick too hard on it just yet, saying that if he wants to, they can just talk about it later. But Rick then says that he's put it off for long enough and just tells him that he's already got a pretty good idea of what he wants. And finally adding that he'll put up a pretty strong argument against it. Carl of course fires back saying that blacksmithing is a useful skill and that he's got to do something, right? And while Rick does say that the hilltop is just too far, he does concede a little, saying that he'll at least think about it. And again, to the slightly older Carl, this is a win and he does not push his luck. Though we then cut to Rick and Andrea going to bed where Rick talks about just that with Andrea saying that she is proud of him for at least thinking about it. And there's also a very wholesome scene here of Andrea saying that he's not Rick's little boy anymore, but Rick correcting her, our little boy. Carl and Andrea's relationship is one of those things that I really missed in the adaptation, especially with both Rick and Michonne poofing out of existence, so this familial bond was never really there. Well, it was. But then Michonne decided to traumatize her children by just literally leaving them. And then Daryl, arguably one of the closest people to the Grimes family, also decided, yeah, you know what, I want my own spin-off, so I'ma traumatize you as well, ka -chow. 
And then Maggie also decided, yeah, you know what? I like this idea of spin-offs and I don't want to be your aunt anymore and ka-chow. Oh, and Negan? The one person who Judith actually seemed to develop a bizarre friendship with? Yeah, he also liked the idea of the spin-off, so he's gone. Great parenting, folks. Maybe that's why we always followed Rick in the series. He seemed to be the only one to care about his son, huh? Alright, jokes aside, seeing Carl call Andrea his mom for the first time was just a really sweet moment in the books. And this is just that, showing us just how tight this family has become. Though, with night falling, we then cut to Carl walking down some stairs, sitting down in a chair, and beginning to casually talk about his day. He begins by talking about relationships, and there are a lot of very fun lines in here which I will let you discover on your own. But then he's asked whether he has already talked to his dad. Carl answers, yeah he did and that he said he'd think about it. To which the yet unrevealed voice says, yeah, I called it. Rick seems very overprotective, not that there's anything wrong with that. And as Carl stands up and gets ready to leave, the voice thanks them for their talks, saying it helps them mark time and also saying that they think it's good for Carl to talk to someone honestly. To which Carl responds, yeah, I'll come back tomorrow. And right as Carl leaves, we finally cut to the other side of the conversation. Negan sitting in the cage and asking, after all this time, after all these talks and things we've shared, do you still want to kill me? To which Carl bluntly responds, Yes, Negan, you know I do. And oh boy, trust me when I say I was floored when I first read this. I mean, obviously, putting Negan in a cage was more than likely a Chekhov's gun, right? But him appearing so soon, and not through Rick like we'd see in the show, but through Carl having these talks, and the absolute best part? At first, Negan plays it off as if he's totally fine with it, just asking, how would he know? They've shared a lot between each other. It comes as a shock. And in the traditional Negan way, smiles ear to ear saying, I thought we were friends. But as Carl leaves, we quickly see that, no, that wasn't sarcasm or a typical sassy response. He is genuinely hurt. And I still remember thinking, wait, hold on. How many times has he asked this question before? Is this some recurring thing where he just hopes that one day Carl would say no? It's a really small scene, but with Negan generally being a lot more lenient in the book, I think it just further humanized a villain who, let's be honest, absolutely no one thought could ever be considered as anything but a monster. And that final shot of him just slumping up against the wall and for the first time in this entire conversation swearing, this was definitely a big oof. Which is made an even bigger oof with the benefit of hindsight and knowing the events of Here's Negan. We then cut all the way to Marco and Ken who have rode off into this uncharted area. And as much as Marco tries telling Ken that this is dangerous, Ken persists effectively saying that the horses are too valuable to let go. Though, soon thereafter, they run into a group of walkers, Ken's horse sends him flying and breaking his leg, and generally, things are very, very bad. Marco then proceeds to call him an idiot, but for now, they get on his horse and ride off. I think even those of you who don't know exactly what's going on here have at least a very good idea of what this is leading to. But yes, their little escapade will only get worse from here on out. But again, adaptation-wise, this is just what I mentioned before. The pre-Rick exit stuff is added for the show, and all of this canon stuff happens in the lead into The Whispers, which we'll cover next time. Just note that the characters here are Marco and Ken, whereas in the show, that would of course be Daryl and Rosita. A quick scene we get before returning to Rick is Eugene arriving home and calling for Rosita, but simply finding a note saying that she's out late and to not wait up for her. First off, this is one of those things that I think the show absolutely nailed with Eugene, mostly because I think Josh McDermott was just perfect in the role, but this is just straight up depressing. And I think the show did a great job of showcasing a lot of those more nuanced feelings of anxiousness and self-doubt that Eugene had in the book. But secondly, obviously this whole don't stay up vibe is exactly what you think it is. Just like in the show, Rosita has a lover in Sadiq and they're doing their own little thing. Something that, personally, I always read as Eugene being fully aware of. Which just made this whole thing that much more depressing. 
The show did decide to make this whole Rosita cheating thing a little more wacky with both Sadiq and Gabriel being thrown into the mix, but at the same time, Eugene wasn't ever explicitly married to her as he is in the book, but whatever the case, the concept of it is at least there in both versions. And the very last thing to cover today is Rick's decision when it comes to Carl and the Hilltop, and so we see them exchange a few words before dinner. Carl once again brings up that literally all he did today was carve some stuff and it feels like he's wasting his time. Something that Rick can't really even respond to. Carl then begins to get even angrier, saying that everyone worships Rick Grimes but that he can't do anything. But he is then promptly cut off as Rick says to save that strength for tomorrow. Saying that tomorrow, you and I are going to the hilltop. And with that, we get a huge splash panel of Carl jumping in for a hug and immediately running off to tell Josh. But as soon as he's away, Rick's smile quickly disappears. Because clearly, to him, Carl is still that little boy that he had to protect. And with that said, this is where we'll stop for today. I know it seems like a bit of an odd stopping point, but canon-wise, we've covered a lot of the remixes and can now safely dive right into the whole bridge and ultimately the absolutely legendary episode that is what comes after. Maybe you're also thinking this, but I had seriously forgotten how ridiculously dense the story was post-time skip, especially with the first issue back also being extended, and then with Angela Kang going in guns blazing and adapting things from like 30 issues down the line. Something tells me Season 9 will be a ton of fun to cover, but I don't even want to imagine how many parts this is going to have. This is already longer than a lot of the previous episodes, and we literally covered like one episode. Oh boy. Anyway, all that said, next time we'll be delving into some Negan drama in the books, some Negan drama in the TV version, and perhaps most importantly, Aaron 100% embracing his Rick cosplay. Oh yeah, and also the main character literally leaving the show, but that's like no big deal, right? And that's the video. Well, here we are. We are finally entering what I view as the final saga of The Walking Dead. With the One Piece series now wrapped up, I'm hoping to pick up the pace somewhat with these, but no promises just yet. With the double uploads of The Last of Us and with the immense scope creep that this series has seen, putting these together is a ridiculous amount of work, I'll say that. Oh, and side note, I'm guessing if you've made it this far, you're not one of the weird boys. But let me say this, we humans are relatively complex beings, right? It is totally fine to enjoy The Last of Us and The Walking Dead at the same time. The number of weird takes I've seen about The Last of Us and just constantly comparing it to The Walking Dead is so weird. And like, yeah, I'm starting to think that in 2023, liking multiple things at the same time is apparently a foreign concept. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!